Hello, and welcome to today's episode where I'm with Professor Gregory Dawes. Um, so you're a professor of philosophy, um, specializing in philosophy of religion at University of Otago, is that right? Yes, yes, that's right. I, I teach in both the philosophy program and the religion program here at Otago. Right. Yep. I think, right. I think I might have a friend who's actually on the theology program over there, actually, now, now oh. it, it comes to mind. Um, but so maybe, maybe he'll uh, watch watch this back at some point. Okay, um, sure. So you, you've re oh, sorry. Uh, Sam Watkins, if you know him. Uh, no, I don't. No, no, that's okay. all right. Okay. Um, so, yeah, you've, you've written several books which um, have been of interest to me and in the kind of questions that I'm interested in around philosophy and religion. So um, one of them was Theism and Explanation. Um, another mm -hmm. one, I'm not going to, a Palgrave book on um, religious epistemology, which I enjoyed yeah. as well. Yep. Um, and then you you also just sent me that Cambridge element that you've just authored on deprovincializing um, science and uh, deprovincializing science and religion, which we're going to kind of talk about a little bit today. Do you want to talk right. a, a, a bit first about some of the motivations behind writing that? Did they just kind of approach you and say, or is this something that you've been looking into as a research area? Well, largely my motivation in the last couple of books I've written has been. Um, extreme boredom with the philosophy of religion as currently practiced because you know if i see another argument for or against the existence of god i want to you know shoot myself um these matters have been debated so thoroughly and continue to be debated in such detail and yet actually they I mean, some of the arguments are extremely good. I mean, my friend and colleague, Graham Oppy, whom I know you've interviewed, has written some wonderful books on these topics. So it's not that the, 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 the arguments aren't good. The arguments on both sides can be very interesting. But, of course, they're dealing only with one particular religious tradition, namely Christian theism. You know, to some degree, these arguments are applicable to Jewish belief and Muslim belief as well. But largely, these are arguments about Christian theism. And yet, in the history of religions, Christianity is, of course, only one. And even monotheistic religions like Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are only one branch of human religious history. Probably the most common form of religious practice in history has been some form of animism, where the natural world is seen as somehow alive or containing spiritual forces. And yet, how many philosophers of religion discuss animism? There are a few today, but not very many. Likewise, Buddhism, for example, which has a, a rich philosophical tradition of its own, gets very little attention within the philosophy of religion. So the whole field seemed to me to be terribly provincial and needed to be to be broadened uh, I'm certainly not the only person to think this but um, you know it just I wanted to join the small group of philosophers who are trying to to broaden the scope of of what we do so so just a, maybe a brief question off the back of that because that's, that's quite interesting to me um, personally as well is what you know? What do you? Where do you view um, argumentation then as sitting within philosophy of religion? Because I think a lot of people might view certain fields of philosophy as sort of being there to kind of generate arguments in favour of certain conclusions. And do you do you think that that's the case in philosophy of religion, or do you think that maybe it should be about something else? If so, what? Um, I think that arguments have a place, but actually, Graham Graham Oppie in a very good little book also in the Palgrave Pivot series a few years ago, pointed out that the scope of arguments is actually very limited. When you've got arguments, well, put it this way, if you come from a theistic tradition, which has a long history of philosophical reflection, and this was my own background within Roman Catholicism, a, you know, a theistic tradition with a long history of reflection, it's very unlikely that any simple deductive argument is going to be able to disprove some of these central religious claims. 
And the reason is that for whatever premises you produce in your argument to disprove my religious belief, almost certainly I will have reason to reject one of those premises. And likewise, if a theist produces arguments against an atheist position, the atheist will have reason to reject one of one of the premises of the argument. So it's it seems that the arguments are often a sort of dialogue where people are talking past each other because neither side feels compelled to accept the premises of the arguments that are being produced. So trying to settle these issues by way of producing, you know, relatively straightforward, simple deductive arguments, even inductive arguments, doesn't seem to be a way of progressing the issue because neither side is going to be convinced. Um, each side has reason to reject the arguments in question. So it just doesn't seem to me to be a very productive way forward. Yeah, thanks for sharing that because I, I sort of have some similar sort of, um, I, I have some similar thoughts about the state of philosophy of religion, you know, particularly people kind of just trading arguments backwards and forwards. And I'm like, mm. I, I, I think we could make more progress if we talk about things a little bit differently, you know, across camps. And I, I like Oppie's proposal of um, bit, sort of building the best theories that embed the kind of core claims and then comparing yep. them based on virtues. But then there's, there's questions about, you know, are those virtues, um, theoretical virtues, stance independent in a way that both kind of worldviews yeah. can sign up yeah. for? Yeah. But 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 I think I think Graham's absolutely right that he talks about comparing worldviews and the whole idea of a worldview is difficult, complicated, but nonetheless he's right that we're not just comparing individual claims; we're comparing networks of claims on each side which are linked with one another. It's a bit like you know Quine's point about a web of belief. In each case, you've got webs of belief, and therefore arguments which attack individual beliefs without taking into account the fact that they're connected with other beliefs within a, a network are not going to get you very far. So I think, yeah, Graham is absolutely right. If you really wanted to make progress on these issues, you'd have to say, well, which worldview, maybe a naturalistic one or a theistic one, has greater explanatory power overall, looked at as a whole, you know, a whole... Um, a network of beliefs uh, set in an intellect complex worldview. Mm. So, so the first question then um, about your deprovincializing science and religion book um, is going to be, well, what are science and religion? So in the context that yep. you're talking, I, and maybe I should have included in this question, you know, what does it mean to kind of like deprovincialize them as well? Yeah. My idea about, about deprovincializing was that, again, to put science and religion, both what we think of as science and religion, in some kind of historical context. I mean, modern science begins in the 17th century, the science we know with people like Galileo. And, but of course, before the birth of modern science, there was already, for example, Aristotelian natural philosophy. And Aristotle was, as well as a philosopher, certainly a scientist. I mean, he spent his biological works, Aristotle's biological works, are quite remarkable. I mean, he carefully, carefully observed. He didn't do experimentation, as we know it, because experimentation is really a product of the 17th century, where you, you don't just observe, but you modify the conditions under which you observe by controlling for various variables and and so on. But Aristotle was a very, very good observer of the natural world and wrote works which would have to count as scientific. And yet the assumptions Aristotle employed were very different from those which modern scientists employ. For example, teleological explanations, explanations that appeal to the goal of some natural process are very central to Aristotelian science. And yet in modern science, they're pretty marginal. So even in the Western tradition, you've got a, a tradition of scientific inquiry, which flourished from Aristotle onwards, particularly in the Middle Ages, 
but which doesn't get much attention in discussions of science and religion. And then, of course, you've got in China, for example, which is my other example, a complex cosmology uh, using principles like yin and yang and others, but which also seeks to explain the natural world, but using a style of reasoning and a set of principles radically different from those which, which we employ in modern science. And yet this also would count as, well, I define a science as a communal tradition of inquiry, which seeks to set out a systematic account of the principles governing the natural world. Um, and, you know, the, the, the Chinese did that as well. But in a way, I mean, underlying Chinese traditional medicine is still the system of thought. Um, and yet again, this gets, you know, it doesn't get much attention. But in both of these, the relation between scientific and religious claims is very different from the relation between the two in, in Western and modern science. So I was trying to say, look, you know, whose science, which religion is the question here, because there have been many forms of science, just as there have been many forms of religion, and they have related differently down through the ages. One thing that you talk about in the introduction section where you kind of um, do offer a few kind of candidate um, definitions for these terms. Yeah. What, one of the things you talk about is a view that someone might take that religion is sort of like a, a primitive attempt at a scientific explanation. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about why you might kind of resist that way of looking at things? No, it's, it's a very good point because this was a view quite popular in the late 19th, early 20th century, the anthropologist E.B. Tylor um, liked to say that, you know, that so-called primitive peoples who invoked gods to explain things, what they were doing was in a sense quite rational. They had just got their science wrong. They just identified the wrong sort of causes. E.B. Tylor famously remarked that um, gods are just personified causes I think though most anthropologists today would say that that's not quite right, that whatever lies behind religion is not the sort of disinterested inquiry into the nature of things. Uh, religions have more to do with the guidance of human behaviour, with religions employ myths, stories, narratives of one kind and another, that seek to shape human society that it's not religions religions have a slightly different goal they do they do make explanatory claims but they're doing much more than that as well and so to think of religion as sort of a primitive kind of science it's not entirely wrong but it's it rather it rather um it's rather one side of you, I think, of, what, of how religions operate. So one of the things you talk about in um, the Cambridge Elements book as well is traditional knowledge and how traditional knowledge um, fits in mm. with religion. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, this is a big topic in my own country at the moment because the indigenous people of New Zealand, the, the Maori people, there's a, quite a revival at the moment of of Māori traditional knowledge, known as Mātoranga Māori, which is just Māori knowledge. Um, and there's been a lot of debate about the relationship between Mātoranga Māori and science, for example. But of course, traditional knowledge, it tends to be a very broad category. So in small-scale societies, tribal societies, which have bodies of knowledge, they cover both questions like what are, stories about the origins of the world. So all things are often traced back to superhuman beings who walked the earth at the beginning of time or in some primeval period. These are kind of like gods, if you like. So the natural world can be traced back to, to gods. So within Maori tradition, for example, everything Everything in the natural world has its ancestry, its whakapapa, and that ancestry ultimately goes back to the age of the gods, if you like, or the superhuman 
ancestors who who walked the earth. So that aspect of traditional knowledge looks kind of religious. And yet, on, on the other hand, of course, there's a lot of traditional knowledge drawn from careful observation of the natural world. So knowledge about the cycle of the seasons, about the calendar, about planting practices, about the healing properties of plants or the medicinal properties of plants. or And yet there are also accounts of of other species and how they relate to human beings. So sometimes other animals are thought of in some Native American or Central American cultures, other animals are thought of as having an interior life and a society much like that of human beings. But my point in a way was that, look, here you have something that really cuts across our science religion divide to ask, are these forms of traditional knowledge religious or scientific is kind of silly because you know these categories just don't apply you've got something which is a, a much more integrated complex whole and so i think again to kind of relativize our questions about science and religion by saying that sometimes these categories just aren't helpful in dealing with other cultures so is, is the idea here something along the lines of um, that people are sort of almost treating the term science and religion in like essentialist terms or something as, as if they kind of carve nature at the joints, but actually they're quite kind of socially um, constructed, perhaps we might say, or, or cult culturally contingent uh, on the kind of um, linguistic practices we're nested within. So when we try and kind of apply them to other cultures and their ways of thinking about the world, it's just inappropriate in the same way we might um i don't know someone might be a bible scholar and they might try and you know interpret what a certain new testament passage means and they just get mm. it completely wrong because the word just doesn't have you know it doesn't like one-to-one -one translate in the same way yes the anthropologist rodney needham many years ago he wrote a book about belief in which he said look we talk about religious belief but the idea of belief has a very particular history within western culture becomes terribly important in terms of the profession of certain articles of faith within Christianity. It's exacerbated at the time of the Reformation where holding the right belief in opposition to the wrong belief becomes. But actually, Needham says, in many cultures, it's very difficult to make sense of the idea of belief. It just doesn't seem to be an applicable category. Now, for my... What I find really interesting teaching across two programs, because I teach in the religion program here, where we study a um, whole variety of religious traditions, religious studies, if you like. Uh, it's not a theology program, it's a religion program. So it's, you know, we study a wide range of religious traditions, but also in philosophy. The people who teach in the religion program are very aware that the term religion is deeply problematic. <laughs> Uh, you know, of course, is Buddhism a religion? Well, is Confucianism a religion? Uh, you know, these are very difficult questions to answer. Um, I think, you know, but, you know, you, you can offer an answer, but the questions are complex. So we're taking a term which is developed within Western history and applying it to, um, you know, there are those, for example, who argue that Hinduism as a religion is kind of a, a product of the Indian encounter with Western society in the colonial period where, in a sense, the colonizers turned a diversity of Indian religious practices into a religion called Hinduism. Now, that's probably a bit simplistic, but nonetheless, that's the sort of discussion that is held in, in the religion program quite a lot. And yet philosophers seem often blissfully unaware of this as though religion were just sort of naturally, you know, as you say, a kind of natural kind that you can apply the category indiscriminately wherever. Well, you know, I think people who study religions carefully don't think that anymore. <laughs> mm. So an another thing that you talk about in the book are um, cosmologies. Um, so. And this sort of comes under traditional knowledge, I suppose, in a way. So what, you know, what are cosmologies um, and how, 
how do they um, differ from mm. sci scientific um, sort of um, webs of belief, as you were kind of talking about before, perhaps? Um, and how do they fit in with kind of like what we might call religious webs of belief? Yeah. Um, my, I think the difference here is that, well, my example of a cosmology was the uh, the cosmology which developed in China during the Warring State periods and the Qin and former Han dynasties, which was a complex view of the world. It was highly systematized. There are a set of principles which explained why things occurred. What made it different, I think, from modern science is that there's no is ought distinction, that this was a set of principles which was thought to guide human behavior as well as explaining the way the natural world operates. So it was, in a sense, an all embracing set of principles. So, you know, the emperor will be guided by the philosophers in how to act at particular times in order to be acting consistently with the very principles, you know which guided the natural world. So I think a cosmology in this sense is broader than, uh, again, you can, again, it's difficult to make distinctions between science and religion here, although notoriously the role of heaven in Chinese cosmology varied. Heaven is sometimes personified as almost a deity, other times it's thought of as kind of a, a natural principle. So, but it's certainly more all embracing than modern science, where we have a clear distinction between is and ought. The scientists describe the way the world is, how we ought to behave is a question for moral philosophers, perhaps, but it's not customarily thought of as a, a scientific question. So, again, you know, the cosmology developed in ancient China, which is a very rich and complex tradition, which I don't pretend to understand as well as I should. Nonetheless, it's, it again, to some degree, cuts across our science-religion distinction. Yeah, I think maybe so some of the things that we were talking about in the previous question and this question sort of do, do come more under... Um, you know, almost almost like a kind of enlightenment idea that things like you know you know that um, certain features of our our reasoning or our language do attach to the way that objective reality kind of sits, and it, and they don't kind of turn that a, a critical lens against the fact that you know the kind of linguistic practices we occupy are, are culturally con conditioned or contingent in certain ways, or you know the tools of of reason that we might use to reach certain conclusions that might not be. Um, we might not view them as correct if we were raised in, you know, the Karaha right. tribe or whatever, somewhere else. Yeah, and of course, this is this is a very tricky issue because anthropologists notoriously tend to fall into a kind of relativism. <laughs> okay. you know, where, and philosophers are rightly anxious about falling into any kind of relativism because, of course, we want to say that, look, you know, the modern science is modern science has got a lot of things right and right. has actually latched on to important features of the world. Um, you know, we're all very grateful for the work of immunologists who have developed vaccines against COVID. And the last thing I'd want to do is to, you know, claim to be debunking science. That would be catastrophically silly. Um, nonetheless, I think What's important to realize is that science offers one way of, if you like, modeling the world. I think what we need to avoid is the kind of a simple, what John Dewey, the pragmatist philosopher, called it a, a spectator theory of knowledge, as though, or Richard Rorty following Dewey refers to, you know, the mind as a mirror of nature as though the sciences merely hold up a mirror to the world. I think that's naive as well. The sciences provide a very successful way of representing the world, modeling the world, 
which achieves certain goals extraordinarily well, which is why, say, medical science has become universal, really, because it does such a good job, or physics or chemistry. But, of course, it's one way of modelling the world, and there are others. Um, Husserl, the uh, founder of phenomenology, Edmund Husserl, in the 1930s, wrote about this, about the development of scientific models of the world which abstract from the richness of the human life world to create abstract models which are very powerful in their predictive power and extraordinarily useful but also leave a lot of things out <laughs> and he thought that phenomenology should be a way of recovering the richness of our experienced world while appreciating what the sciences do not thinking that science should be considered the measure of what exists. You know, we need a, uh, it doesn't need to be an exclusive kind of view that the scientific way of modeling the world is the only way of modeling the world, which might be useful for different purposes. Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's perhaps easy to see how almost a, a naive view of the sciences is sort of um, just attaching to reality, but not being, you know, nested within any kind of pragmatic context, or um, not being privy to certain like biases and uh, and heuristics that we might use for thinking about things, can, can easily lead to almost like um, sort of su pseudo scientific or bad philosophical views. You know, that, that poor inferences perhaps about like race realism or phrenology and things like that if, if you're just kind of naively interpreting well it's what the science says you know uh, without kind of um mm. properly interpreting what's going on there. yeah i think i think i think there are two issues here which we probably need to distinguish one is the sort of social embeddedness of science um richard lewinton the biologist was very strong on this that science he argued is always political for better or for worse. I mean, he was a great evolutionary biologist and geneticist, so one of our leading scientists. But Lewinton was very clear that, look, inevitably science is shaped by its social context. And of course, as you've alluded to, the race science of the 19th and early 20th century was a striking instance of this, where scientists found what their prejudices you know, led them to find. And yet this was presented as though it was, was value-free science. Obviously, that can be a problem. So we shouldn't be naive about the influence of, of if you like, extra scientific factors on science. On the other hand, even science at its best is only one way of representing the world even when it does so very accurately for particular purposes. You know, for example, you know, you can give a scientific description of, of a sunset, <laughs> what's happening as the light is refracted through the atmosphere and certain frequencies are tuned out and appears red. But look, you can write a poem about a sunset and that's revealing something about a, sun, a sunset as well. They're both giving you knowledge but the different kinds of knowledge. And, um, and therefore, we need to realize that we just, we just have this diversity of ways in which human beings represent reality. And telling stories about, it, about the ancestors, as many indigenous peoples do, myths about the origins of the world, these can also convey knowledge, even if they're not literally true. Um, they can still convey knowledge about, about our experience of the world. So I think, I think sort of being open to a kind of cognitive pluralism, that there are many ways of knowing. Uh, science is an extraordinarily successful one for certain purposes, but we shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't think that everything has to be consistent with what the sciences tell us. No, there are many ways of representing reality, um, and. We shouldn't try and we shouldn't try and homogenize them all, <laughs> make them all make them all one, because that I think um, impoverishes our view of reality. Yeah, I, I very much like um, 
the theologian Don Cupid, uh, he, he has kind of like a naturalized account of religion. And um, he sort of suggested, he, he was kind of like very, very heavily influenced by ordinary language philosophy. And he liked to look at the way that people would deliver funeral eulogies, for example, in modern times and compare that to like how people would have talked about things in me uh, in medieval times where they might have said, well, you know, she lived a very pious life or something. She lived a very pious life. She had a reverence for God. Whereas today, you know, people would say things like, um, well, she she really lived her life. You know, she she loved had had um she she really loved life. She lived a good life, things like that. And he and he'd say, well, we'll just look at kind of what's going on in these different situations. Even though the even though we're not using terms like God anymore, there's still kind of a need for this ritual and ceremony and kind of you know just just providing the view from nowhere as it were of what's going on in that situation well the problem is that you are somewhere you can't sort of take off your mind as a yeah, person you yeah. have to be a person and, and perhaps that means doing things that aren't you know that that are irrational like funeral ceremonies well of course that's really interesting because um of course there are those like Cupid who and and others as well there's this what's it called this um this movement to have a, a Sunday service, which is non, not oh, like an atheistic sort of church type thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I can't, I can't recall what it's called now, but I think you're right. We have a hankering for ritual, and what Cooper urged, of course, was uh, taking part in the ritual without the belief. I'm not sure how workable that is in the case of traditional religious rituals. But of course, I, yeah, I can understand, you know, the role of ritual within human life is very important. And in some ways, I think I, what strikes me, I mean, my background is Roman Catholic, so I was deeply immersed in ritual. And, you know, we had a complex series of funeral rituals Roman Catholics had, which would last you know, more than just a single hour in the church. We'll begin the night before with a service in the church and then there'll be something following it. Generally, drinks at the home of the of the bereaved. A lot of whiskey will be consumed because we were Irish Catholics. And then there'll be the mass the next day. Then you'd go to the to the graveside and there'll be more ritual and then you'd um, go back to the house it was a complex series of rituals which were a very powerful way of dealing with the experience of bereavement. And yet for many people today, funeral services are kind of an embarrassment. They don't quite know what to do. You know, the, the rituals we lack at the moment, maybe we'll develop secular rituals to deal with death. But the, the Maori people here in New Zealand have a wonderful series of rituals to do with death. The the tangi, which is again often a three day affair, um, and you know, once again, I think there's much we can learn from um, indigenous peoples about about ritual and the value of myth and narrative, which we've lost in the West. So, so the next question then is, so. I suppose maybe what's this thing called natural philosophy and how does that interact with and shape religious thought? And I suppose this is going to be a bit more of a um, an historical an, an historical question as well, because, um, you know, there's kind of it's kind of tracing the contours of history through the Catholic Church, I suppose, and the university system and how natural philosophy almost fleshes out into what we might call um, what, what we might call science today or a kind of like proto-science in some sense, but is deeply integrated with religious thought as well. Yeah, I think this is this is very interesting because um, natural philosophy is really the medieval term for what we would call science. It's a study of the natural world largely shaped by Aristotle's natural philosophy by Aristotle's thought. It didn't normally invoke God. That's very interesting here because people often think that the naturalism of modern science is very modern. You know, that in the modern world, scientists don't, can, don't invoke God to explain anything, which is true. You know, scientists don't. If you turned up to a scientific conference and say, well, you know, 
the reason for this is that God did it. <laughs> that ain't a scientific explanation. What I find very interesting historically, though, is that actually, as I understand it, by the 14th century, 13th and 14th century, under the influence of Aristotle, there was a thriving tradition of explanation of the natural world within medieval universities in the West, which also abstained from God talk. It appealed only to natural causes. And this was often made quite explicit in the work of people like John Buridan in Paris, where they would say, you know, the purpose of natural philosophy is to explain natural things appealing to natural causes. And they made it quite clear that, you know, God was the job of the theologians. <laughs> now, obviously, they couldn't say things which were inconsistent with the Christian faith. So, for example, Aristotle's idea that the world was eternal, it had always existed, was inconsistent with the idea that the world was created. So sometimes there were clashes between the two. But nonetheless, what natural philosophy offered was, a again, something quite close to what we would call science, although using rather different principles, a way of explaining the natural world without reference to God. So one of my, uh, I did a paper with my former student, Tilly Smith, some years ago on the origins of the naturalism of the sciences. And I think actually it's very old and it goes back to the Middle Ages at least, if not if not ancient times. Because even, even in the ancient Greek world, you of course famously get people like Hippocrates. There's a great treatise by Hippocrates, a very famous one, the founder of medicine, as is often thought of back in the fourth century, Hippocrates BC, Hippocrates writes a treatise on epilepsy in which he says, called the sacred disease. And he says, people think epilepsy is caused by possession by a demon or a, a spirit. But of course it's not. It's caused by something happening in the brain. Now, his view of the brain isn't quite right. <laughs> but hey, you know, he was, he was just beginning this whole thing. So that's fine. But, you know, he was amongst those early Greek thinkers who said, no, 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 when we examine the natural world, we don't bring the gods into it. So I think this is actually a very ancient practice. And again, a bit of history helps to shed light on, on why the sciences today don't talk about God. It's not as Alvin Planting, it seems to think, a kind of um, atheistic bias. That's nonsense. Just, just ignorance of history, as far as I'm concerned, because even medieval natural philosophers adopted the same principle who were devout Christians. They didn't mix up their, their religion, their theology and their science. They kept the two distinct. And that, I think, is actually yeah, very interesting and important. So speaking of Alvin Plantinga then, the next question was, is there a conflict between science and religion? Um, so I suppose this is from, from our point of view today rather than um, historically, you know, how, yeah, yeah. how should we sh should we think that there's kind of, you know, non-overlapping magisteria or, um, you know, as a kind of one advances the other retreats, so to speak, or, or should we think of them in a more nuanced way? Uh, what are your thoughts? I think... Neither of those works. The non-overlapping magisteria idea of Stephen Jay Gould, very attractive if you could make it work. And of course, um, you know, Galileo had a go at the same idea at one point, trying to keep, you know, science and religion. The problem is, of course, yeah. yeah. The, the problem is, of course, that they do make overlapping claims. And the example I gave a moment ago was one of them. If you're an Aristotelian, you think that the world has always existed. If you're a Christian, you think the world had a beginning. Well, these two aren't compatible. <laughs> so, you've, you know, the two do overlap at times. I think if there is a conflict, or conf if conflicts sometimes arise, as they do, it's not that there's a necessary conflict, but if conflicts arise, it's because of what I've called in my little Galileo book, an epistemological dualism in religion that alongside reason 
which is what you use when you're doing natural philosophy or science. You have another source of knowledge, which is religious faith. And in people like Thomas Aquinas, religious faith and reason, although they're thought of as complementary, they're still distinct sources of knowledge. This is very clear in Roman Catholic theology, but I think it's much more widespread as well. So you know certain things by faith, you know certain things by reason, and these are distinct sources of knowledge. Now, John Locke in the 17th century tried to sort of bring these two together and turn everything into reason. <laughs> but actually, in the history of Christian thought, faith and reason are thought of as distinct sources of knowledge. So I call this an epistemological dualism. So if we you know certain things by faith and other things by reason, there's always going to be the potential that these will come into conflict. And I think that's the real root of the conflict between, well, of the conflicts which sometimes occur between science and religion, because of course, it's not inevitable. You can readjust your religion to fit your science and so on. But, but um, when the conflicts occur as they do, it's because of this idea of two sources of knowledge do you think that there's a conflict in in the sense of the kind of um social context that they're nested in so so one might argue that we you know we have to make um laws about how to govern society and uh, and such things and science might be telling us you know well here's an evidence based here's something about say the outcomes of um conversion th therapy for sexuality right and someone who is mm -hmm. Ha might have like well i've got you know these theological beliefs about um you know the efficacy of prayer and pray you know praying for people who uh, don't want to um have a particular sexuality because it's sinful or something and so we have to but we have to choose to legislate either way is there kind of more of a conflict in that arena perhaps obviously yes i mean there certainly can be conflicts in that arena but of course philosophers john rawls probably being the most famous. John Rawls' book, Political Liberalism, is a wonderful discussion of how you negotiate these you know, very different worldviews, if you like, getting back to the idea of worldviews, religious and non-religious, how we live together, having a common political world while coming out of maybe radically different religious and non-religious worldviews. I mean, that's a big problem for political philosophy. I'm a bit of a fan of John Rawls. I like his attempts to solve the problem, to say essentially, look, we need to find areas of common reason, overlapping reason, where we can talk together about how we create policies we can all live with, even though they may not reflect what either side would in an ideal world like to see. But they're, they're, that's just the question in political philosophy. It's an important one. But um, I think if there's a deeper conflict, it's because if you think that your knowledge, your source of knowledge is a divine revelation, that knowledge will be considered sacred, untouchable in some sense. It can be reinterpreted but it can't be abandoned. Whereas, of course, the sciences, which don't think of themselves as based on a divine revelation, <laughs> um, the sciences can radically, you know, you can have scientific revolutions. You can have radically new theories emerging over the course of time. Religious traditions are bound to some original revelation in a way that science is not. And they surround that original revelation with an aura of sanctity, which tends to make it unquestionable. Uh, the anthropologist Roy Rappaport has written very well about uh, how the sacred, although Durkheim said this back in the 19th century, the sacred tends to be that which is set aside and untouchable. So I think religious thought is governed by a very different set of norms, by a very different set of principles from scientific thought as well because of that.
So my next question then, and um, you've written about this in a couple of places, um, is do special forms of religious knowledge um, belong in the academy? So um, I think this is particularly in response to, for example, reformed epistemology and the idea that, you know, so certain people might have a kind of census divinitatis, which has in some way, you know, conferred them with some kind of like special subjective um, information about the divine that other people might not be privy to or can't be intersubjectively tested or something. Well, I think if it can't be intersubjectively tested, then it just doesn't belong in the academy. I mean, we have to, you know, I'm, who knows, there may be forms of knowledge which, you know, rely on sort of personal intuition and so on. That's fine. But, and of course, you know, this is much debated in philosophy of science these days, but there was a traditional distinction between the context of discovery and the context of justification. You might have had a dream, for example, as Kekulé, the chemist, famously did about the structure of the benzene molecule. You might have had a dream in which you saw the molecule in your dream. Well, that's fine. Have the dream. But you then need to produce the proof. And the proof has to be something we can all test. So inspiration is fine. But when it comes to the academy, we need to be dealing with things which are intersubjectively testable. I think the problem with reformed epistemology is just that it's it's kind of it's trivially true, but that's another question. It's not interesting. It's um, anyway, but th that's a question you may or may not want to pursue. <laughs> it, but by, by that, do you mean the the way that, for example, um, planting will talk about like the what's the, the de jure objection doesn't matter it's the de facto object you know if god exists then i have this and it's like well yeah isn't that just what we were talking about in the first place when yeah. i was well, objecting it, well of course his basic claim as i understand it is um if christian faith is true then it is warranted and by warranted of course he's got this externalist idea of produced by a reliable mechanism a reliable mechanism being a combination of the sensus divinitatis, which all human beings have, and the internal instigation of the Holy Spirit, the inner witness of the Holy Spirit that John Calvin talked about, which only Christians have because it's a gift from God. Um, but actually, this boils down to a claim, if Christianity is true, well, Christianity is a whole set of beliefs, including belief in the sensus divinitatis and the internal instigation of the Holy Spirit. So if Christianity is true, then a whole set of beliefs are true, including those two. Then, of course, Christianity is warranted because those two beliefs are true. So the whole of, of Reformed epistemology boils down to a claim which has the same logical form as if it is Wednesday and it is raining, then it is raining. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. If, if God exists and there's a census divinitatis and there is an internal instigation of the Holy Spirit and God sent Jesus to redeem the world and Jesus rose from the dead, then there is a census divinitatis and an internal instigation of the Holy Spirit. Yes, this is trivially true, but it's a conditional. And there is no reason at all to accept the condition. And I refuse to believe that this should be of any philosophical interest. And I resent having had to read big, complex books of Plantinga's to realise how silly this was. Anyway. Can, can I ask um, brief, briefly while we're on this point, um, what, what are your thoughts about Plantinga's kind of... Um great pumpkin objection uh response so i i think a relatively good objection to um to reformed epistemology is to say well look isn't there kind of isn't there a sort of parity here between the theological story that you're telling me to kind of justify your belief mm, and mm. what the mormon might tell me when they say you know they have a burning in the bosom or perhaps a muslim says in prayer they had they experience a green light and they just know god exists or something like that i mean i think i think it's less tends to be less experiential in Islam. But, um, you know, there are the, these sort of things that people will talk about. Uh, uh, Krishna, Krishna's chanting Krishna's name and saying, you know, I just know Krishna exists from, it, from this experience. Um, the question is, 
what, so on what what principled reason can you provide for telling me that you know your experience isn't kind of debunked by some kind of psychological story or, or is actually caused by god in the same way that you don't think uh, sorry sorry um what what principled reason can you provide me um to say that yours is caused by god whereas in these other cases that uh, you know just caused debunked by psychological explanations or whatever um do you, uh, and then plantinga has this whole thing about you know the the great pumpkin and um is it linus or the the um charlie brown mm. cartoons that he talks about and I, I don't fully understand how that is an adequate response to um this kind of parity objection may perhaps you could explain what planting his thought is there and if you well i that. i'm probably not a good person to try and okay. explain <laughs> planting his thought because i'm so unsympathetic to it but um he seems to in the end simply say well yes but these people are wrong um, okay. And yet, and yet, the the problem is that the stru the the structure of the argument is identical. So, my way of dealing with this was to, for my students, come up with a a parallel argument, which was about a group of aliens called, I call them the Zeoplians, just to have a name, and these aliens are in stationary Earth orbit above my town of Dunedin here in New Zealand, and they have chosen me to be their messenger. And when I was a child, I was abducted by the Zeoplians. My parents thought I was lost in the shopping mall, but I was abducted by the Zeoplians and they implanted in my brain a reliable cognitive mechanism, which I call the sensus alienorum, the sense of aliens, because I can speak Latin too. And, and this is how I know these things, and this is how I can convey these messages from the, the Zeoplians. Well, if the story is true, then my belief is it's warranted because it's produced by a reliable cognitive mechanism, which the story tells you about. But of course, there is this is batty stuff. There's absolutely no reason on earth to believe it. And yet, exactly the same line of reasoning can be applied to it as can be applied to the Christian faith as defended by Plantinga. Um, if it's true, it's warranted. Yes, if there really are Zeoplians, and yes, if they did abduct me, and yes, if they did implant a reliable cognitive mechanism in, in my brain, then everything I'm telling you is going to be true. So what? You know, um, this, this is just... This is just silly stuff really and further it's uh possibly necessary that the zeoplians implanted that in your brain so we can we can make a mo uh, a modal ontological argument for it using s5 to <laughs> oh yes um, that, that's right yes although actually in fairness to planting it he admits that his own modal ontological argument is not going to be convincing, convincing yeah. to someone who doesn't accept the initial premise so i, sh I should concede that much to to planting it um <laughs> so yes. uh, the the last question then which touches on um your book um the was the title theism and explanation uh god and theistic yeah, yeah. explanation something along those lines um is going to be so we, we've talked about sort of deprovincializing um science and religion a lot of contemporary philosophers of religion will sort of appeal to some ph phenomena whether it be the fine-tuning of the universe or consciousness or moral knowledge mm. for example um, or, or the laws of nature um, and say, well, the best explanation of this is um, that a God exists and, and made it that way. Or they, they might not say it's the best explanation. They might, you know, use some kind of Bayesian analysis and um, give some very big numbers in favor of theism or, or, you know, say that it's very strong evidence in favor of the theistic hypothesis rather than a naturalistic hypothesis. Um, mm. So can theistic explanations be good explanations? And how can they be good explanations? What should we be looking for um, in them? Yeah. I must admit I'm much more sympathetic to this, I'm much more sympathetic to the Richard Swinburne style of argument for the existence of God than the attempt to just avoid evidence altogether, which reformed epistemology seems to be doing. Um, so I'm happy to take such arguments seriously. I think that I think it's Philip Kitcher who makes the point that somewhere that's you know 
God did it would not be an adequate explanation of anything simply because it could explain anything at all. So we need, if you wanted to offer a, a theistic explanation, what you need to do is to be more specific. You need to offer an account of what it was that God was attempting to achieve when he allegedly did whatever he did so that the explanation has some sort of content. So the parallel um, I might make is if I were to get up now and open the window, I'm going to open the window next to me, and you say to me, why did you open the window? And I say, because I wanted to. You might say, well, I know that. I presumed you did it because you wanted to. You haven't answered my question. You haven't given me any reason why you opened the window. So it seems to me that key to any, any theistic explanation that you could take it all seriously has to be that it has some content, that it has, you know, you're not just saying God did it. Well, that could explain anything at all, but therefore explains nothing. You have to come up with some account of what God was attempting to do when he brought about this effect. Then, of course, it has to be testable. You have to say, well, if this is true, what else would you expect to see in the world? Or even, okay, given that God is God, is this the best way he could have brought about this effect? At which point the theistic explanation might start looking a bit shaky. Um, so, for example, the, the, the example I, I give in the book is, look, God wants to create human beings. Okay, fine. God wants to create beings who are conscious, who have free will, who can relate to him. Great. That's why God created human beings. How might we expect God to do this? Or does he set up an evolution, you know, a long history evolutionary process which involves enormous amounts of waste and suffering and so that eventually human beings might emerge? Or does he think, I could do this immediately? Or maybe I could do it in six days just to, you know, make it a bit more interesting. I could just bring everything out of nothing because I'm God. And this wouldn't evolve a long period of waste and suffering and I could just have the human beings I wanted. I think the authors of Genesis came up with basically the way you would have expected God to create a world if he was going to do so. The idea that God will create human beings by way of evolution, this just seems to me to be deeply implausible. It's a terrible way of creating human beings if you're an omnipotent being. So, yeah, um, those are the kind of considerations I want to bring to bear on, on a theistic explanation. Not only would God have a reason to do this, but is this the best way in which a deity could bring about this effect? And if it isn't, then your explanation's not looking very good. So how, how do you think that people who are arguing in this way can avoid a kind of hindsight bias where... Um, you know, they're, they're allegedly providing, you know, what their hypothesis says and the kind of predictions it makes, but really they're kind of just describing everything that they want and specifying it into yeah. the hypothesis. How, how can people avoid doing that if they've, you know, if they've already got, uh, particularly, you know, perhaps as Westerners who went to like primary school and we've been taught about Christian yeah. monotheism or something like that, and we have certain ideas. How, I think, is there a way we can... Yeah, I think I think that's a very good point. That actually, um, I mean, the ideal thing you want in a scientific theory is that it makes novel predictions. That it, it doesn't just explain what you already have, but that it predicts something which you can then go out and observe. So you say, well, if this theory is true, then from the movement of this planet, we can predict that there must be another planet out there and we can then go and discover it, for example. Um, so you make a prediction based on the theory which enables you to discover some new fact. Now, maybe you, you don't have to do that to have a good explanation, but it gives you a great deal more confidence if you can. 
And a lot of theistic explanations don't seem to be like this. They're simply providing an account of what we already know, I think. So I'm, I'm just trying to think um, in terms of the kind of like hindsight bias type thing, is there a way, do you think there's a good way of getting around that as in, you know, as say, say ind individual philosophers who are thinking of maybe writing papers um, of, of this form, is there any good way of getting around the bias or is it just going to be a kind of necessary feature, do you think, of, uh, of this type of argument? Well, no, it's not a necessary feature. I mean, for example, the, the fine-tuning argument holds is generally a probabilistic argument, which says, look, you've got two, two hypotheses here. You've got, you know, that there is a creator God who designed the world, who fine-tuned the universe, or that the universe was capable of supporting life just by chance, if there was only a single universe. But the, the probability of, you know, rather the other way around, the likelihood of the universe being capable of supporting life is much greater given a god than given mere chance. That's not a silly argument, and I think it doesn't, I think it's wrong, it's mistaken on various grounds. Um, but nonetheless, it's not in itself a, it doesn't, it's not a bad argument. It's a kind of a probabilistic argument, although of course it doesn't take you very far, but it gives you it gives you some evidence in support of a God hypothesis if the argument is sound. So, um, I mean, there are forms of theistic argument that I think, um, at least at first sight, are not obviously wrong. <laughs> what well, what well, well, maybe? To, to specify what I mean here using that fine-tuning example, someone might say, yeah. well, just a priori what I mean by theism is um, like a self-sufficient um, entity who would never, you know, create any create any other like living organisms or anything like that. And so um, it actually has a really, really low um, probability given theism that there would be life like us created. And so it's evidence against and that against and then the theist would say well when i think about god you know i mean the kind of god who would you know desire to create beings like us because we're moral agents and so and, and it's like well where hang on where's this come from and it's like you know well the theology that you already hold to and it's difficult to kind of pass apart the the two yeah 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 i see i see your point i think there's nothing wrong in principle with what philosophers call inference the best explanation or abductive reasoning where what you're doing is you're saying, look, here we have something which needs to be explained. I don't, I'm not convinced that the so-called fine-tuning of the universe does need to be explained, but leaving that aside, say, say you thought this is a puzzling fact that the universe is capable of supporting life. There's nothing wrong with positing a cause, imagining what would explain this if you could then find independent evidence in support of that hypothesis. So I'm trying to think of a, a scientific example. Um, but I think in, this the, is... in the book, didn't you give um, special relativity and the observations of light? Or is this, have I got you confused with um, Elliot Sober? I might have confused that. I'd be very happy to be yeah. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll, I'll be very happy to be confused with Elliot Sober. There are worse people to be confused with. But <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I just think that, well, okay. Um, okay, you might observe some phenomenon in a cathode ray tube, as Thompson did in the 19th century, some phenomenon in a cathode ray tube. And, you know, you might observe that given certain electrical charges, a tiny wheel is spinning, a tiny fan is spinning in the vacuum of the cathode ray tube. And you say, well, if there were charged particles having some tiny degree of mass passing between you know, the cathode and the anode, that would account for the spinning of the wheel. I've probably got my physics terribly wrong here, but never mind. 
you get the idea. And then you say, okay, let's see if we can find any other evidence for charged particles. So what you've done is you've dreamt up a possible explanation. And then you go looking for independent evidence and its support. So that style of reasoning is not, is not bad in principle. Um, so the problem, of course, in the God case is finding independent evidence and its support. So yeah. it, it's although, specifying the hypothesis in such a way that you can actually, you know, put some some empirical content. I think is what you talk about it on yeah. the on the bones of the explanation. Yeah, exactly. Otherwise, as you say, it just becomes, you know, I've dreamt up something which happens to fit these facts. Isn't that convenient? Yeah. Well, that's okay. Any, anyone can dream up a possible explanation, but you need to be able to test it in some way to see if there's some independent evidence in its support. So, and that's where it's much harder in the case of theistic explanations. Um, was there more you wanted? If I don't, I don't want to interrupt. If there was more you wanted to say about that, no. Okay, so um, Josh in the chat has asked, um, which does Gregory think is the most compelling philosophical argument? For oh. God? I guess I've always liked some version of the modal cosmological argument. Um, I'm not in the end convinced by it, but. You know, um, you know, some version of why is there anything rather than nothing? <laughs> if it's the case that the existence of the universe is a contingent fact, and if it's the fact, if it's if the principle of sufficient reason is true that every contingent fact has a cause, and if nothing can be the cause of itself, which I was, which seems right. <laughs> <laughs> then it looks as though the universe must have a cause which is other than itself. So that kind of modal cosmological argument, I don't accept the premises. I'm not, I don't see why we should believe the existence of the universe is a contingent fact, nor do I think the principle of sufficient reason is true, that every contingent fact has a cause. Nonetheless, <laughs> it's a cool argument. I think that um, you know, it's an argument you have to work quite hard at to see what's wrong with it. It's an argument for the universe having a cause which is other than, than itself. It doesn't tell you that the cause is God, but at least it takes you a step in that direction. So I think if I, I've always found this the most interesting form of of argument for the existence of God, um, yeah. Do Do you think that there are um, good arguments for atheism specifically um, in the sort of same way that there are f potentially for um, theism? So the kind of the kind of project, the kind of arguments that might be provided um, from natural theology for theism. I guess, I guess generally people are going to look at the problem of evil for atheism. Um, but do you think uh, perhaps besides the problem of evil, there are kind of like good arguments for atheism that can be on par with the kind of arguments that theists will provide? So I'm sort of thinking that it's good, it's good, it, it seems sort of weird to me, for example, to provide an argument from like some causal maxim or some kind of, um, you know, principle of sufficient reason uh, to the conclusion, therefore, you know, like all of all of reality is exhausted by natural entities or something or and and therefore you know god doesn't exist it where, whereas in the case of theism it doesn't seem as weird to me to provide arguments of that kind um i mean yeah. what do you think about the state of arguments for for atheism i personally i think that arguments from evil are the are the most powerful forms of argument for atheism. I mean, Paul Draper's evidential argument for evil, from, from evil. Um, I think that at the end of the day, it's very hard to posit the existence of an all-powerful, all-knowing. I mean, it was more convincing back in the day when you thought that the world began 6,000 years ago and Adam and Eve were the first human beings and they rebelled against God 
and the whole world suffered as a result of their rebellion so that all evil could be traced back to a human free choice. Even that wasn't terribly convincing. But, but since we no longer, most of us, believe that the world began 6,000 years ago with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, um, the argument from evil just seems to me to be the most compelling form of atheist argument. Um, I don't find arguments from, you know, from the naturalism of the sciences. I think they overreach themselves, you know, that to say, well, the sciences tell us that all that exists are natural realities. There are no supernatural realities. I think that's just an overreach about what science can claim to say for the reasons we discussed at the beginning. So I think, you know, an argument from evil at the end of the day is the the hardest one, I think, to counter if you're a theist. Awesome. Well, um, I think we can wrap it up around that because we're just coming up to um, one hour, 11 minutes now. So I don't want to, I'm aware it's, it's reasonably late as well for you. So I don't want to go too long. Um, <laughs> is, right. is there anything that you would want to make people aware of that you're working on at the minute? Um, at, you know, like any books for them to check out or, um, you know, any projects coming up that you'd want to direct people mm. towards or talks? Well, look, I'm, I'm trying to work on a big book, which I've entitled Ways of Knowing Towards a Cross cross-cultural epistemology um, because one of the hot topics when it comes to the relationship between indigenous ways of knowing and Western science is the claim made by advocates of indigenous knowledge that there are many ways of knowing. Now, as I said at the beginning, I think that's true, but on the other hand, this is an idea that calls out for philosophical clarification. What do we mean by knowledge? Because if you think of knowledge as you know, involving justified true belief, that on the face of it, you either know something or you don't. <laughs> you know, it's either true or it's false. You've just got two values here, true or false, you either know it or you don't. But if, uh, if you think of our ways of knowing the world as mediated by metaphors, by models. Well, a metaphor is actually literally false, and yet it can be very informative. And a model is often highly simplified, and yet can, can tell us something. And metaphors and models don't have to be consistent with one another. So I think if you have a, a view of knowledge which doesn't necessarily involve true belief, that might involve some substitute for truth, one that various philosophers have tried for is truth-likeness or partial truth, perhaps, or some somewhat more sophisticated idea of knowledge which would allow for us to have very different ways of representing the world across cultures, which might nonetheless all constitute instances of knowledge. So a kind of a kind of cognitive pluralism. I mean, again, quite a lot of people have been working on this, but it's a, it's a project that interests me um, so that we can accept the value of modern Western science, all in favour, yay for science, <laughs> while also recognising that different cultures can have different ways of knowing which are valuable perhaps in other domains for other purposes, but which also count as instances of knowledge, even if they look very different from, from scientific knowledge. So that's the big kind of project that interests me at the moment. But I don't expect this to, uh, this is going to take a while. <laughs> right. Well, so, so maybe I'll br briefly ask um, off the back of that, what, what you think about the kind of prospects for um, like pragmatist sort of accounts of knowledge. So something mm. that came to mind while you were talking was, um, I forget whether it was William James or C.S. Peirce, but what, one of them gives this story about a squirrel and a tree and says, you know, they were out walking <laughs> with friends. Yeah, there's a squirrel on the tree and, they, you know, the, the philosophers are debating for hours um, about what would constitute, you know, going round the, going round the squirrel. And, it, and the um, sort of 
moral of the story is it kind of depends on what you're trying to do. So if you, you know, if, yeah. if you're trying yeah. to assess whether the squirrel has a cut on its back, then you want to like the squirrel to kind of stay relatively stationary and, you know, you go round it so you can see on its back. But if you, you know, if you wanted to kind of, what was it? The squirrel moves round on the opposite side of the tree at the same time as the person's going round. And that was yeah. for a different pragmatic yeah. context. And yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think it was William James. I'm pretty sure. But yeah, um, I'm very attracted to pragmatic accounts of knowledge. Although, of course, the kind of parody of a pragmatist account of knowledge, which is, you know, knowledge is what it's good to believe, what it's useful to believe, doesn't seem adequate. <laughs> it's because, you know, lots of things might be useful to believe, but be false. Um, so, but the idea nonetheless that we, what we know of the world is shaped by what we're doing at the time, by how we're interacting with it. There's a psychologist, James Gibson, who has what's called an ecological theory of perception. And he argues that we perceive the world in terms of affordances, he calls them, what actions it makes possible for us. So I see the cup as affording me a way to drink. I see the seat as affording me a place to sit. I see the table as affording me a place to put my book down. Um, and he argues that this is a very basic way of perceiving that lots of animals have. So my cat perceives a chair as something which can be sat upon. What's interesting about this idea of affordances is that it's all action relative. How we perceive the world is, is as enabling certain kinds of action. So we don't just see the world as it is in itself, independently of us. And yet we're not simply projecting our ideas onto the world either. I can be right or wrong. I can think that, you know, the chair is sit uponable. Then when I sit upon it, it collapses. So I was wrong. My belief about the, you know, I didn't perceive the chair correctly. So I think Gibson's idea of affordances offers a beginning of a different way of thinking about knowledge, which is more activity related and which allows us to say that how we perceive the world will depend upon the kind of activity in which we're engaged. And yet we're not, it's not idealism, we're not projecting our ideas onto the world, because we can still be right or wrong. We can still um, misperceive. And, and so there's a kind of a conception of truth here, but it's also a practice relative conception of truth which is broadly pragmatist, I think. So that's the direction in which I think a kind of revised, I tend to say reformed epistemology, <laughs> a revised epistemology um, might want to go. It's thoroughly naturalistic as well, because yeah. um, there's nothing mysterious here. It's how organisms find their way around the world. So I think... Something along those lines would offer us a more interesting view of, of knowledge than the kind of what John Dewey calls, Dewey, of course, being another founder of pragmatism, the spectator theory of knowledge, where I just open my eyes and the world is there, independently of me or whatever I'm doing. No, I don't think it's quite like that. So, yeah, I'm very inspired by the pragmatist tradition, um, although, of course, the questions here are very difficult, but um, uh, uh, yeah, I think something like that is a direction to go. And and in a sense, that might um, have some answers as to sort of the legitimacy, as it were, of um, you know, like these traditional forms of knowing versus scientific, because it depends on just the pragmatic context we're situated in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's what I'd like to be able to say. I'd like to be able to say, look, you know. This culture has this story, this practice, this tradition. It doesn't look compatible with science. Do we just say it's wrong? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a bit blunt. <laughs> Let's try and understand how they're interacting with the world in such a way that this is the way the world appears to them. And maybe they've latched onto something as well, which we've missed. <laughs> so 
because we are interacting with the world differently. So that, that's my hope, is for a more, a more, I'm tempted to say Catholic with a small c. <laughs> right, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A plur pluralistic or universal yeah. encompassing. A more, a more pluralistic approach to knowledge. There are lots of people doing this again. Um, there's a guy called Stephen Horst who's written a couple of very good books in favour of cognitive pluralism along not unrelated lines. So uh, I don't pretend I'm saying anything terribly new here, but I'd like to contribute to this project, certainly. Yep. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on and uh, giving up your time to talk about these things with me. Um, That's a pleasure. I, 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 I'm reminded of a colleague of mine who got back from a lecture tour in the States, and he said to me, Greg, he said, they paid me to talk. I know you're not paying me. That's fine. He <laughs> Sorry. Said, yeah. He said, no, no, it's fine. He said, it was like paying a cat to eat cream. <laughs> so, you know, it's always a pleasure to talk, of course, about yeah. the ideas that interest me. So, so thank you. Yeah, there's a, not not a whole lot of money in the uh, in the no, YouTube no, no. philosophy world, but unfortunately, <laughs> that's fine. I'm just saying it's more like it's yeah. more like the more like the cat eating cream. It's a pleasure to talk. Right. So, yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah, I, I I'm glad, and I hope it's uh, useful for people who are interested in these things as well to uh, yeah, listen to. Yeah. If anyone's interested, they're always welcome to email me. You could find my email on the Otago University, O, o T A G O. Um, you're welcome to email me, and I, as long as I don't get hundreds of emails, I'll attempt to respond. <laughs> so David is just saying thanks there in the chat. Great, great. Th th thanks, David. I'll be very happy to talk again. Okay, well, I'll end the stream there. Thank you, everyone, for watching, um, and have a good weekend.